Hey Caruso, this is Jared Mays from the Lemonster Church of Christ in Lemonster, Massachusetts. Have you ever heard the song that never ends? You know what I'm talking about, right? This is the song that never ends. It goes and goes and goes, and it goes like this. This is the song that never ends. Okay, and it's on a loop forever and ever and ever, and it's not exactly the most interesting song to listen to. Let's put it that way. When it comes to ending your sermon, you want to actually successfully land the plane so as to propel other people who have heard your sermon to go out and be eager to apply what it is that God's Word has communicated to them that particular week. One of the greatest crimes when it comes to a sermon conclusion would be to drag out the sermon for so long that people are just eager for it to end rather than motivated to apply what they've heard. I like to think about the analogy of the plane that just endlessly circles the runway. Maybe it's gotten all the way to its destination in good time in, in good enough time, but then for whatever reason, uh, there might be a holdup on the runway, and so the plane just circles and has to just be at the destination, but not actually on the ground. Unfortunately, uh, a sermon that goes on too long can be a lot like this, can't it? There's a few good ways to end a sermon. There's not one perfect way. I'll tell you a few. One great way to end a sermon is to give very clear, specific, creative action items, points of application that go from the text itself, moving the listeners toward actually putting it into action in their lives in our modern context this week. Some basic points of application that I'll typically run through at the end of a sermon, uh, at least in the sermon writing process, I don't always use these, but would apply to a pretty good swath of your congregation, right, would be to think about how does this look in your school this week? How does this look in your workplace this week? What does this look like at home? Okay, you know, paying attention to the context of your different members. Um, when I was preaching in South Arkansas before I moved here, almost the entire congregation fit into one of two categories, farmers and teachers. So I had a lot of specific points that applied to them. Make sure that your action items are tailored toward the actual members of your congregation, though not targeted. Tailored but not targeted. Uh, you want to basically be igniting the, the spark of creativity and imagination for your listeners to be thinking about, well, what does this look like for me this week? You can't do all the, create, the, the creativity for them. You can't do all the imagining, but you can do some. You can get them started, get the ball rolling. Another great way to end a sermon is to uh, end with a question, right? End by saying, Jesus has offered you the deal of a lifetime. The question I want to leave you with is this, will you accept it? Another great way to end, of course, more traditionally would be uh, to end with an invitation. And I would say make sure that the invitation is not exactly uh, word for word, exactly the same each week. In fact, I would say that some sermons, some texts do not lend themselves well to an invitation, such as uh, a marriage, uh, a marriage, divorce and remarriage sermon may not need to have an invitation or, or about the qualifications of elders, maybe not uh, in those specific categories. However, give careful consideration to the theological stance of your elders, the congregation where you're preaching, especially if you're a guest or if it's your first time preaching. Know if the elders are very, very adamant that you actually do offer an invitation because there's been a lot of debate about this at Caruso over the years. I will say this, that if you always end with exactly the same invitation every time, people have already turned you off. Um, they've already turned off the switch of their ears and are uh, making their way. You can often hear the pages of the songbooks turning if your congregation still has songbooks at this point in time. That's never a good sign for me. Or if I see the song leader getting antsy and uh, trying to make his way forward, and uh, little does he know, sometimes I've still got 10 minutes left in the sermon. The fact of the matter is this. I read a book in high school that I, I actually enjoyed. It was one of these books that I was tasked with reading for, for summer reading. And uh, it was rare for me to find one that I just really loved. I had made it through the first 350 pages of the book, had paid close attention, had actually uh, talked to some friends about how much I was enjoying it. The author reached her conclusion, got to the finale, 
and then spent another hundred pages going on and on and on about the lives of the main characters for the next ten years, the fallout, uh, what it looked like for them after the the climax, right after the the conclusion, after the finale of the book. And God forbid that's what we do in our sermons, right? We hit the high point, we reach the conclusion, and then spend another 10 minutes or 100 pages, hopefully not with a sermon, right? Going on and on and on. No, you want to make sure that as you're building tension in your sermon, you're setting up a problem to be solved or a dilemma to be explored, that you are leading and building tension to the high point being the very end of of your sermon. If it's a problem to be solved, maybe the the conclusion is this, there is no solution but the gospel, right? God has reached the culmination of his grand plan by sending his son. But make sure that you're not reaching the conclusion of your sermon and then still preaching for another 10 minutes. I am the chief among sinners when it comes to this and uh, I've learned the hard way, okay? Just ask my uh, the members of my congregation. Sermons are about tension, setting up the tension, building the tension, highs and lows, ultimately reaching this point where people are eager to go and apply and put into action what you've set up, what God's Word has been communicating. Now, this is certainly something that comes with practice. It's certainly something that your mentors can help you with as they help you refine the beginning and end of your sermon. I'm so happy that you've dedicated this time toward learning how to craft a sermon and to serve the kingdom of God. God bless.